All right. Welcome, everyone. Good evening. I'm James Brooks. I'm president of SAR and, and truly delighted to see such a great turnout for what promises to be a very, very interesting and exciting evening. We are so fortunate to be able to have David Carrasco with us this evening, um, and I think you will shortly see why. Before I begin, though, I have a question for you all. How many of you are members? Okay, ooh, okay, about, yeah, nice. How many of you received your annual review in today's mail? Not bad. This was a bulk mailing that went out yesterday. It suggests to me that the Postal Service has very little to do anymore, uh, which is a little bit worrisome. <laughs> but that's great. And um, how many of you actually had a chance to look at it? <laughs> yeah, two, okay. Well, you, you, those of you who are longtime members will know that, that you'll, you'll receive this and you'll go, wow, it's kind of small, what's, you know, what's going on? Um, this is only the appetizer for what, is, for what is actually a much bigger and richer version of our annual review, which is now entirely digital. And it's hosted on the SAR website, and it has things like audio files, it has film, it has multiple photography, real, real depth. So we'd hope when you get this, all you have to do, every single page has the, the URL at the bottom and you can just dive into that site and spend as much time as you'd like. And so we lowered our carbon footprint by about 50%. We lowered our direct cost by about 50%. And we hope that we delivered an additional 50% of content to you. So uh, please enjoy. And we'd love to hear from you when, when you uh, have spent some time with it. Uh, before I introduce Dr. Carrasco, though, I want to thank our sponsors, uh, Betty and Luke Vortman, Starline Printing, who uh, printed our lecture series program, The Visual and the Virtual, Rendering Humanity Visible. That was my one contribution to the series, was to come up with the title. Uh, C.T. and Susie Herman, longtime supporters of SAR and the lecture series. Bank of America, Thornburg Investment Management, the William H. Donner Foundation, the Lannan Foundation, a new sponsor. We're very grateful for their support. And I especially want to uh, uh, thank Glenn and Shirley Davidson, who will be hosting the dinner for Dr. Carrasco after tonight's lecture. David Carrasco is the Neil Rudenstein Professor of the Study of Latin America with a joint appointment in the Department of Anthropology and the Divinity School at Harvard University. He has a Master of Theology, an MA, and a PhD from the University of Chicago, and among his uh, mentors there at Chicago was Dr. Glenn Davidson. So we're kind of closing a circle here. We're delighted to be able to bring these old colleagues together again. Dr. Carrasco is a Mexican-American historian of religions, and especially to emphasize the plural in that, with a particular interest in the religious dimensions of the human experience, Mesoamerican cities as symbols, immigration, and the Mexican-American borderlands. This has resulted in publications on ritual violence and sacred cities, religion and transculturation, the great Aztec temple, and the history of religions in Mesoamerica and other Latino regions. Recent collaborate, collaborative publications with Mexican archaeologists include Breaking Through Mexico's Past, Digging the Aztecs with Eduardo Matos Moctezuma, and the subject of tonight's work, Cave, City, and Eagle's Nest, an interpretive journey through the Mapa de Coatincan, number two which was published in 2007 and was the winner of the 2008 PubWest Book Design Award, as well as being featured in the New York Times and the New York Review of Books. His work has included a special emphasis on the religious dimensions of the Latino experience, mestizaje, the myth of Aztlan, about which we will hear tonight, transculturation, and La Virgen de Guadalupe. His most recent publication is a new abridgment of Bernal Diaz del Castillo's memoir of the conquest, Mex uh, conquest of Mexico, History of the Conquest of New Spain, which is just out from the University of New Mexico Press. Dr. Carrasco has received recently the Mexican Order of the Aztec Eagle, the highest honor the Mexican government can give to a foreign national. Now, it was in 2008, however, that David Carrasco was at SAR 
as a participant in a, one of our advanced seminars on colonial and post-colonial change in Mesoamerica, archaeology as historical anthropology, that John Kantner and I discovered uh, the project about which you will hear tonight. And that was when we began scheming to bring David here. So let's welcome Dr. Carrasco. Thank you very much, um, James Brooks. I, I know that all of us who have had admiration and relationships with the SAR over the years can only be reinvigorated by the kind of expert leadership that he has given uh, to this organization that, that means so much, not only to the state of New Mexico, but actually to anthropological, literary, and artistic investigations uh, around the United States. So I'm very honored to be here with, with James Brooks. I do also would like to mention my mentor, one of my mentors at the University of Chicago, who was mentioned earlier, Glenn Davidson. Uh, I know some of you know uh, Dr. Davidson as I knew him. I can tell you that when I was a student of his, uh, starting out at the University of Chicago, I took courses with him. And uh, to this day, I still have the papers uh, that I wrote for him, in which he wrote in very neat handwriting, detailed and very careful responses and critiques of my work. I've kept them to this day in red ink uh, I meant to bring it, but I forgot to bring it, but I, I was looking at it just the other day. It's amazing how right on he was. Uh, uh, and it's great to, to be here with him. It's like Mark Twain said, you know, at the time I thought, this guy's out of his mind. But, but now I realize after 15 years how much he's learned uh, in the process. Uh, he, was, he was also another person I'd like to mention uh, that's great to be back here with is Luther Wilson, uh, the uh, former director of the University of New Mexico Press. Uh, who had the uh, wisdom and courage to go ahead and publish this book, uh, which has become not only award winner, uh, but a real symbol of the excellence of the University of New Mexico Press. So I'm grateful to be here with him. I'd also like to do a shout out for a longtime friend of mine, Yolanda Nava, who's here. Uh, Yolanda has for many years uh, made important contributions uh, to the uh, cultural identity of Latinos and Latinas, uh, and uh, spent some time here uh, in, uh, in New Mexico uh, working with the National Hispanic Center. Uh, it's wonderful to be with all of you tonight. Um, and I want to thank Santa Fe and also the School of Advanced Research for inviting me to be part of this lecture series, the title of which is The Visual and the Virtual, Rendering Humanity Visible. I've come here tonight to help make a human community in Mexico visible to you by retelling in words and images the story they told themselves the story they told themselves about their gods, their pilgrimage, and their destiny. It is a great story, an epic story, of the Americas that has been rendered into this beautiful book, as I said, that was published here in New Mexico. Together, this great story, which is the stories within stories, and this beautiful book of painted stories, constitutes a significant innovation in scholarship and publishing about Mexico, and especially the religious dimensions of Mexican heritage. I will try and persuade you that this combination of story and book will enrich and renovate the ways the public and scholars alike look at, comprehend, and interpret not only this codex, this visual masterpiece, but all Mesoamerican codices pre-Hispanic and colonial and other indigenous American life. It can be argued that the reappearance and study of the Quautin can be compared in its significance. I'm here with the sound. Hang on here, we gotta get the sound right. Okay, let me try it again. It can be argued that the apparent reappearance and study of the Mapa de Cuautin Chan and it can be compared in its significance for Mesoamerican peoples, studies and the studies of religions to the finding and deciphering of a Dead Sea Scroll or a Gnostic Gospel, early biblical text telling of the existence, 
values and beliefs of early Hebrew communities, or in the case of the Gnostics, the teachings of Jesus. You will want to know that of the thousands of pre-Hispanic screenfuls and codices extant at the time of European arrivals in the New World, tragically, only 15 of these pre-Hispanic painted and pictorial manuscripts have survived. Fortunately, indigenous priests, scribes, painters continued, often in secret, producing their sacred histories and calendars. You're going to witness tonight something like an unveiling of the most beautiful and complex surviving indigenous colonial paintings in the Americas. We became involved. It's fascinating in itself. Seven years ago uh, at Harvard University, uh, every May they have this gathering at the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies uh, where they bring in David Rockefeller uh, and all of his banker friends. Uh, who make these wonderful contributions uh, to Harvard. Um, and uh, during this uh, annual May meeting, the director of the David Rockefeller Center, uh, a historian uh, of uh, Mexican economics, a man named John Coatsworth, uh, came to me during this, this meeting of, of this gathering and said uh, in very low tones, hey, by, by any chance, have you ever heard of this codex uh, called the Mapa de Cuautin Chan that uh, disappeared in Mexico some, some years ago. Um, and uh, I said, well, yeah, I know something about it because at that time I had just finished editing the Oxford Encyclopedia of Mesoamerican Cultures. Uh, and uh, in the array of documents that we looked at, uh, there was a study in reference uh, to this very important. Um, so then he said, well, listen, a member of our advisory board from a very, very wealthy Mexican family has just come to me and said that she owns this codex. Uh, and she would like to know if there's anybody at Harvard that could read it. Um, and I said, well, you know, give me a chance. Um, um, and so what I did is I flew to Mexico City. I went to the home of uh, Angeles Espinosa Iglesias, uh, which is like a fortified uh, uh, home there uh, in the area of San Angel. Uh, and I went into the home, and there on the walls was a Monet, Manet, the Picassos, and all of this. Uh, and she said, well, would you like to see the Codex? And I said, I'd love to see the Codex. Uh, and she went over to this, uh, uh, you know, this pantry where she, she kept some of her china, and she pulled out this drawer, and there folded up uh, in, on, it was, this, uh, was this masterpiece from 1540s uh, in, in Mexico. Um, and I began to look at it, and I, I realized two things immediately. Um, uh, 